in the 15th chapter of John, in the 5th verse, I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Apart from him, we can do nothing. If you turn to Galatians, chapter 6, and verse 3, If a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. We are nothing. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 4, 4. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. We know nothing. We're in a pretty helpless case, aren't we? And 2 Corinthians 6, 10. As sorrowful yet all were rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. I remember once at Keswick, many years ago, there was a German baroness there. She was every bitter baroness. She moved among the people in a very dignified way. And she evidently very much liked people addressing her as baroness this and baroness that. At the early morning prayer meeting, dear old F.B. Meyer was presiding and he asked if anybody would like to select a hymn. And Baroness von Drash said, Oh, to be nothing, uh, nothing. <laughs> and old brother Meyer leaned over and he said, Baroness, you are nothing. She looked up quite so, so surprised. It's very well to have it as a sentiment, but it's quite another thing to recognize it as a fact. If you took, turn to 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, I'm starting at the 27th verse. Ye you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Even the Lord Jesus Christ himself said that everything he had came from his father. He said, the words that I speak are not mine, and the father that's in me, he, that is with me, he doeth the works. So Christ's words and works he attributed to the father. You must remember that the Lord Jesus submitted himself to the limitations of a human being in order that he might in everything be tempted like as we are. Says in Philippians that although he was in the form of God, he thought it not a thing to be grasped at, to be equal with God. But he 
took upon him the form of a servant, of a slave, humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we are told, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That is the attitude which God would have you and me recognize. The fact that we are utterly dependent on God. Now let us start out by seeing that in everything, in all we have, and in all we are, we are influenced by outside sources. We are being, we don't know, we don't know how much oxygen there is in the atmosphere, but I see that already one or two are getting their eyelids a bit heavy. You're being influenced by the fact that there's not enough oxygen in the atmosphere. There are rays running through the room at the present time bringing news from New York and Kamskatka and Timbuktu and I don't know where all. Man hasn't made them. Man discovered them, that was all. We are under all sorts of influences. They're all always discovering something fresh. But whatever they discover that's fresh, we find it in the old book. And I'd like you to turn to the first Corinthians chapter 12. In the second verse, ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Carried away. Led. Every one of us. Ephesians 2 makes it plain that without exception, every one of us has been under the external influence of a malign, wicked spirit. Ephesians 2, he was dead in trespasses and sins. Well, in time you walk. According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, listen, worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our manner of living in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So that both 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 2 make it plain that we have been under the influence of the prince of the power of the air and his evil spirits in time past. Thank God it need not always be so. Luke 11 gives us a wonderful picture of a man like a house. And this house is protected and owned. A strong man armed keepeth his house, and his goods are in peace. But a stronger than he cometh, taketh from him his armor wherein he trusted, and divideth the spoils, he clears the strong man out. You and I have been possessed. But thank God this house can have a notice up. Under new ownership, the strong man turned out and is stronger than he in possession. And now we are still moved by a power outside ourselves. But instead of a malign evil power, it's a glorious, beautiful, wonderful power. And what we are unable to accomplish of ourselves, we can accomplish in the power that possesses us. Get it very clearly that 
we are possessed. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Isn't that a staggering fact? As to his body, Jesus is on the throne beside his Father. And yet, it's equally true that Jesus lives inside of me. And so, I can expect something which of myself is utterly, hopelessly impossible. I can expect it because of him. And we rely on his strength and his power and not on ourselves. It says, we read it just now, that no man should boast. I read that again and again. That no man should boast. Who are at to boast, you know? I've heard some of these great evangelists They've been heralded by God's man of the day and the hour, the great, the mighty evangelist. Well, it's not what Paul did. You find again and again, as you read in the Acts of the Apostles, that Paul didn't say what I've done and what I've accomplished, but rather what God has done through me and what God has accomplished. Look, for instance, I'll give you an instance or two. Acts chapter 14. Paul had come back from his missionary trip. And he'd gone to Antioch whence he had been recommended to the grace of God for the work he had performed. And in verse 27, when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. Not what Paul and Barnabas had done, but what God had done with them. And I notice that one or two of you are taking notes. You can make a note of Acts 19, verse 11. In fact, you, you can find the same thing in that verse we so often quote in Mark 16. Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So they went forth, preaching the word everywhere. God working with them and confirming the word with signs for them. It was God that did the job. It wasn't they. They were instruments in his hand. But the glory goes not to man, but to God. God also working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Isn't it a wonderful thing that Jesus can live in us? Christ liveth in me, sing it. Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation this, that Christ liveth in me. Amazing fact, Jesus living in us. Now, what we could not accomplish, he accomplishes with us. I'd like you to come here, brother. Come here. Hold out your hands. Put your Bible in it. How
How long do you think you can hold it? Not very long. <laughs> I've noticed those poor policemen on point duty. And I think they must get awfully tired. They don't have a long spell. They, they have others to take their place. But now, if I wanted to be a help to you, I can support your arm with my arm. And now you can hold it up a bit longer, couldn't I? Thank you, brother. If you turn to Genesis chapter 49, in verse 24, his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. The arms of his hands were made strong by God's hands. Now, he might not be able to hold them up very long of himself, but oh, when they were sustained by God's hands, there's a difference. There's a lovely little bit in Exodus chapter 17. May we look at it? I'm starting at the eighth verse in order that we may get the context. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. And Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Poor old Moses, his arms were heavy. He was an old chap, you know. But when Aaron stood on one side and her on the other and stayed up his arm, he could still hold them up until the going down of the sun when Amalek was completely discomforted. And isn't it wonderful to realize that our hands can be upheld by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob? Brothers and sisters, do you realize that tonight we've got one that's praying for us? He's praying for us. And the one that's praying for us always gets his prayers answered. Do you remember by the side of the tomb of Lazarus, he prayed. He prayed so that the people could hear. He said, Father, I know that thou hearest me always. And the one that's hearing, always heard, is praying for you and me. Doesn't it make us feel safe? I would like you to turn to Luke 22. In the 31st verse, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Do you see that Peter's faith was sustained by Jesus' faith, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Now Peter's faith couldn't, it couldn't fail, because it was sustained by Jesus' faith. And when I may find my arms weary, 
and feel utterly unable to continue. I've got another who sustains and prays and upholds. Now, I want you to consider for a time this other power I've, <coughs> I've pointed out that you and I are possessed. Jesus was born. A doctor was there to give us details of his birth. We know that while he had a human mother, he had no human father. In the opening verses of Romans 1 it says, He was of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power and the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. An old Jew said to me one day, yes, it's all very well to talk about Jesus. There were 16 Jesuses what was killed. Which Jesus do you mean? So we said, uh, we mean the one that got up again after he was killed. You see, he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. This Jesus that got up again after he'd been in the grave three days. He was this wonderful being. But to go back to his birth, we know very well that he was born of God. And yet in Luke chapter 3, I find that down by the river Jordan he was baptized and then something happened. John saw the Holy Spirit like a dove come down and light on him. And it says he was about 30 years of age. So there was 30 years difference between the time he was born and the time that the Holy Spirit came on him. Now I don't know whether there are any, any of my precious brethren of the company of people that are generally known as the Plymouth Brethren among us. But if there are, you know that the general teaching of them is that we are baptized in the Holy Ghost when we are born again. That conversion is the receiving of the Holy Ghost. That's what they teach. <coughs> it didn't happen that way with Jesus, did it? For 30 years we don't hear anything very much about it. But in Acts chapter 10 verse 38, I read that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Down by the Jordan, Jesus, God manifest in the flesh, maker and sustainer of the universe, even he needed to be anointed with the Holy Ghost before he started his job, his three and a half years of public ministry that we read about in the four Gospels. The enemy doesn't seem to have afflicted him much before that, but immediately the Holy Ghost <coughs> came on him. The enemy started to tempt him. He was tempted 40 days. It wasn't only those three temptations at the end, but for 40 days he was tempted. And the three culminating temptations are the ones of which we have detail. And then, I read, he returned in the power of the Spirit to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And he entered into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. There was given to him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he opened it and he started to read. 
the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach glad tidings to the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Ghost at 30 years of age. The word Christ and the word Messiah both mean the anointed one. I was christened William. Most people call me William. My brother calls me Bill. In France they call me Guillaume. In South Africa the Afrikaans folks call me Vellum. But it's all the same. And Christ, the anointed, Messiah are all the same. And people say there's no Jesus in the Old Testament, isn't there? You look at Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the nations imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth join together against the Lord and against his Christ saying, let us cast away their bands. And I don't remember exactly the word, but cast off their cords from it. Against the Lord and against, in other words, his Jesus. Yes, the Lord Jesus is God's anointed one. And now I would like you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, We've seen why he was anointed in that reading of the scriptures in Nazareth that day. He told them, God's anointed me for a particular purpose. If you go to chapter 4, Verse 14, he returned in the power of the Spirit. Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Verse 32, they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Verse 36, what a word is this for with authority and power? He commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And I could go on through chapter after ch chapter. Sometimes the word is translated virtue. You've got to realize that Dr. Luke was a medical man and he used a medical term. But whether you call it power or whether you call it virtue, it was manifest in his speaking, it was manifested in his casting out devils, it was manifested in healing the sick, and it could be felt. This emanation, this something, this undefinable something which was imparted by the gift of the Holy Ghost, could be felt. Jesus was among the crowd and folks jostling him when a woman came up to him. She was suffering and she sneaked up behind him. She oughtn't to have done because when she touched him he was contaminated. But she touched the hem of his garment and something happened. She was made whole. She felt it and he felt it. Yes, this power can be felt. And some of us who are accustomed to laying hands on the sick, we know very well that that power can be experienced 
And we know when it's not there, too. There are times when we lay hands on somebody and nothing happens. It's as though there were a brick wall. There's no flow of the power. We were asked to go to pray for a woman with rheumatoid arthritis. And as we placed our hands on her, oh, it was horrible. There was a resistance. We said to her, sister, what's the matter? You're not trusting God to be healed. And she laughed as if it were a schoolgirl caught out in a tree. And she had to admit that she didn't want to be healed. Although the rheumatoid arthritis was painful and uncomfortable and limited her, nevertheless she had an indulgent husband who cared for her. She had kindly daughters who looked after her. And she said, if I get rid of my rheumatoid arthritis, I shall have to do my own work and go into the town and do my own shopping and so on. And she didn't want it. And we felt it when we first put our hands on her. I read Jesus could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. But to get back to the point, there was a something which flowed from the Lord Jesus, which was imparted with the gift of the Holy Ghost. In the next place, let us realize that Jesus was not only a savior, not only a teacher, but he was an example. First Peter, is it 2.21? Even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. What do you think a disciple is? What is a disciple? A disciple is an apprentice. A disciple is one who follows his master in order to learn how to do it. Jesus says in Matthew 10, a disciple is not above his master nor a servant above his Lord. A man may want to learn painting. And so he goes to a master, one who's skilled in the craft, and he says, you teach me painting. I want to become your disciple. I want to become your learner and learn how to do it. He learns all about the mixing of the colors. He learns the details of the various materials that are employed. He learns so much, but how does he learn? He learns by following his master. And if we are disciples, it means that we are wanting to learn to do what Jesus did. He's our example. I see a good deal in some who profess to be disciples of the Lord Jesus. That's very unlike him. One young man came to him and said, I'll follow you with us wherever you go. But Jesus said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He didn't go in for an elaborate home and servants about him to wait on him. He'd sleep at the back of a hedge in an olive garden or on the gunwale of a boat in a storm or away in the wilderness. I wonder if we're prepared to become disciples of the Lord Jesus. Now, when he was about to leave them, he had a conversation with them which you'll find in John chapter 20.
They were hiding. They got the door shut. They were afraid. And in verse 19 of John 20, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. The sight of those wounds brought peace as it brings peace to you and me today. Having made peace by the blood of his cross. It was when they saw the wounds that peace came to them. And then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father, notice, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And they remained in Jerusalem until they did receive the Holy Ghost. I pointed out that Jesus didn't start his public ministry until he received the Holy Ghost. And he told them, don't you leave Jerusalem till you receive the Holy Ghost. And then he said, I'm sending you precisely as my Father sent me. Oh, what a terrible thing when people begin to removed from the teaching and example of the Lord Jesus, things which he left for you and me. Come here, and you, and you. Stand in the line. Paul says, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same deliver thou to faithful men, that they may teach others also. Does he say anything about his being left off or dropped out or omitted or for the early days of the church? No. Precisely the same things which they received, they were to hand to others that they might receive. <coughs> When he sent them away, in his last instructions in Matthew 28, he said, Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. I say, isn't it a shocking thing when you read in Schofield's Bible that the Sermon on the Mount is not for today? Isn't it a shocking thing when men teach that the gift of the Holy Ghost and the healing of the sick and the casting out of devils are not for today? Shall I show you what the Bible says about those that belittle the teaching of the Lord Jesus? Let us have a look in the sixth chapter of Tim, 1 Timothy. I'm starting at the third verse. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and stripes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. That's what he says about people that don't stand for the words of the Lord Jesus today. They try to dispensationalize them away. 
Oh, they say that was for days of the law. That when you come to the Acts of the Apostles, there's something else. There's nothing beyond what the Lord Jesus Christ taught. And if they want to pretend there is, they're proud knowing nothing. We, we welcome what he has for us. And he says, I'm sending you exactly as I myself have been sent. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And yet it's staggering that a vast majority of the Christian church know nothing about being endued with power from on high and many of them think that if they go to a theological college and come away with a with a scrap of paper which says that they've passed their examinations and so on oh now they're ready to teach Jesus wasn't he hath anointed me to preach glad tidings to the me. And you and I, possessed as we are by the Lord Jesus, we need the power of the Holy Ghost. And we cannot dispense with the power of the Holy Ghost. I pointed out that we are continually under forces beyond ourselves. They were demonic forces. They were from the prince of the power of the air. But oh, how blessed that Jesus lives in us. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And now, he says, I want you filled with the Holy Ghost. Every child of God, this isn't just for professional preachers. It's for every child of God. I would remind you that there was a tiff in the early church because the Grecians and the Hebrews, the widows, they said they get more than we do and we get less than they do and there was an argument about it. So Peter and the other disciples said, let's get the folks together and let them choose somebody to regulate this affair. What affair? Why the bread and butter for the Hebrew women and the Greek women, for the widow? That was what it was. And if you look in Acts chapter 6, you will see the qualifications for men that were to do the job. Look ye out, said Peter. among you verse 3 seven men of honest report full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business you might say that such a simple affair hardly required men of a special caliber but even for that job they needed to be filled with the Holy Ghost And you and I, in all our lives, brothers and sisters, from morning to night, seven days a week, we need to move and live in the Holy Ghost. It isn't for a particular few. It isn't for a few cranks. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached, there was such conviction that the crowds came together and they said, look here, chap, what is expected of us? What shall we do? In verse 37 of Acts 2, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, that word afar off, if there's any Greek scholar here, he'll confirm what I say. 
that word afar off applies equally to time and to place. So that it, may, it may be afar off in time and it may be afar off in place. All that are afar off, that's all that matters, as many as the Lord our God shall call. You may say that that was 1900 years ago. But the far off embraces 1900 years. And you may say we're in Bedford and not in Jerusalem. Yes, but the far off embraces Bedford or Congo or anywhere else. Wherever you are and whenever you are, the promise is unto you. What promise? You know there are a lot of promises. There are hundreds and hundreds of promises. But there's one that's called the promise. Just as in the Old Testament, you have a land of promise. There were many promises in the Old Testament, but you take a colored crayon and go through the book of Deuteronomy and see how many times God refers to the land that was promised, the land that you go to possess it, the land which I've promised. There was one which was the promise, and the children of Israel might enjoy lots of other promises without enjoy, enjoying the promise. Wasn't it sad that a whole generation fell in the wilderness and didn't enter into the promised <coughs> land to enjoy it? And isn't equally sad, more sad, that although the promise, the promise of the Holy Ghost, the promised comforter, is for so many, yet many of them don't enter in and to receive. My old father-in-law, <coughs> in the... <coughs> Long distant days of the diamond diggings on the far river in the trans in the tra uh, on the Val River in Transvaal, staked out a claim when he was a young man of seventeen. Lots of people were digging diamonds, and the man that was uh, digging next to him was Rhodes the man that founded Rhodesia. Rhodes and Henry Trollope were digging side by side. But the young fellow was discouraged. He got a bit of fever. It was hard work. He got a few insignificant diamonds. And then he said, I'm going home. I'm tired. He said to Cecil Rhodes, Rhodes, you can have my claim. And Rhodes took over the two claims and he'd hardly gone a foot lower down in the gravel when he came on some of the loveliest diamonds that had been found in the Transvaal diggings. They were there. And if he hadn't grown discouraged, he could have had them. Oh, his life, his outlook could have been very different. But he didn't persevere. The kingdom of God suffering violence and the violence take it by force. God wants people that mean business with him. The promise is unto you. Dear one, you can move out of this meeting like giants refreshed with a power emanating from you which was the same which emanated from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. Oh, I've seen some of the most illiterate and simple men come out to us in the Congo and do an amazing work. I'm writing at the present time the life 
of a young Swiss lady. I've seen her work. It's been extraordinary. She was a simple girl. Her father turned her out of the home because she started going to some cottage meetings. But she persisted, said, I'm going to learn English. Took a job with a family in the south of London. And while she was there, she went to Boone Street Chapel where Brother Carter and later Brother Barnes were at work. And there she heard about the gift of the Holy Ghost. She was filled with the Spirit. And after a few months in Brother Carter's Bible school, she went out to Central Africa. If ever there was a discouraging, downcasting, miserable condition of affairs, she faced those. It was enough to break the heart of a giant, and here was a simple girl who bravely faced it and went through working up and down the shores of Lake Tanganyika, facing crocodiles and hippopotami, facing storms on the lakes and the oppositions of wild natives who were stirred up against her by the Catholics and by the Mohammedans. And yet she went through to save hundreds and to establish scores of precious assemblies that are existing to this day. How did she do it? She was empowered by that which was beyond herself. She was possessed. She was carried along by the Holy Ghost. I've been out on those lakes. When you saw the storm coming, you made for land. Sometimes on the shore there were crocs. They weren't inclined to give way either. Sometimes one would be intercepted by a school of in, enraged hippos, the old bull, when you come near his herd, gets so furious he'll sometimes come at you with open mouth and the hippo can bite a canoe and the people that are in it in harm. And yet that simple girl went through and accomplished marvel because she was possessed. If you met her, if you knew her, you'd say, what? A woman like that. Why, I don't see anything extraordinary. There wasn't anything extraordinary. They perceived in John and Peter that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And yet what they did, because the power of the Holy Ghost was upon them. Now I'm not talking fairy tales. Brothers and sisters, I'm talking downright facts. And I've seen and experienced what I'm talking about. We wouldn't have missionaries in the Congo evangelistic mission unless they were able to say that they had been endued with power from on high. When Paul came to Ephesus and found the converts of Apollos, his very first question to them was, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? That was what mattered. They heard John preach and they'd been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus that John said was coming. And now there was another baptism. John had said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, the same shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And Paul laid his hands on the Ephesians. There were only twelve of them, and yet we hear later of more of the Ephesian church than of any other church in the Bible, except in the Jerusalem church. They were endued with power from on high. And brother and sister, I come to Bedford. I don't know you. It may be that you all have received the Holy Ghost already. I hope you have. But if you haven't, don't be contented until you go forth as Jesus was sent forth. As the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. 
He said, the works that I do, shall ye do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to the Father. He's still waiting to accompany his word with signs for them. So far as we in the Congo are concerned, in spite of the most hideous persecutions and tortures and murders and massacres that have taken place and are still taking place, the church is growing in leaps and bounds, and God is accompanying his word with signs for them. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4, start at verse 3 for the sake of getting the point, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord Jesus, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now that is the way to preach the gospel. I read in the first chapter of First Peter, they that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from him. I read in Jude, is it verse 19, praying always in the Holy Ghost. What we live for, do, move in, is an atmosphere which is supernatural, carried along by a power beyond ourselves, filled with the Holy Ghost. 